Today we're going to be talking about the Next.js image component. And the main reason that I wanted to create this video is because this component is super, super powerful. There's so many things that it's kind of doing behind the scenes for us and can be so beneficial to our projects, yet it is so often misused and even potentially dangerous from a cost perspective if you don't know what you're doing. So that's the main reason. And also I just needed this tutorial myself. I went out searching for how to use this component effectively, you know, way back when, when I started using it. And unfortunately I wasn't able to find what I needed. The documentation was decent. And I think generally Vercel um, as a company puts together some pretty good documentation, has a good developer experience. But in this particular case, there was just knowledge gaps that I had that I think a lot of other folks have that were not covered in that documentation. I would search Stack Overflow and different blogs and different YouTube videos, and it really just seemed like every one of them was just repeating the documentation, but it left me with tons of unanswered questions like, how do I render images that I don't know the size of beforehand? And how do I do that responsibly? or even why do I have to provide a width and a height to the Next.js image component? So it was questions like that that um, got me uh, inspired to make this tutorial because it took me a while to figure them out and I think it's very valuable to understand what this component's doing and how it can help you. Just a few prerequisites to this uh, tutorial. I'm assuming that you are at the intermediate level as a developer. So you understand what web development is all about, and you also have a little bit of experience definitely with React and ideally a little bit with Next.js and understand in general what this framework is trying to do for you. Um, since I'm gonna be talking at that intermediate level, I think a complete beginner will probably have to pause this and um, learn some things along the way to understand what I'm saying. Well, an advanced web developer, someone that's been in the industry for a while, can still gain a lot from this tutorial. Um, it may just have to skip a few parts. So overall, what, what are we gonna learn? Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is convince you why this is so important. And my past self needed convincing um, and I did not care about enough about images on the web. So I'm gonna convince you why this is so important and why the Next.js image component is so special um, in helping us to uh, use images more effectively on the web. We're then gonna talk about what is image optimization and transformation? What's that all about? Where does Vercel and Next.js come in on that front? And then tangentially, a potentially costly realization about image optimization when you're deploying your projects to the Vercel platform. And then we'll get into the meat of this presentation, which is how to use the Next.js image. How are we using it in different situations? For example, if we have images that are stored locally in our build assets, or if we have a big list of remote images that are coming from a database or an external API, or just, you know, wherever. And then finally, how do we resize our images based on the screen size and make them completely responsive? And then the last thing I'll talk about is a brief migration guide because recently Vercel published their most recent version of Next.js version 13. And with that version, the next future image now became the default image. So there's a lot of projects that are using the legacy image that need to convert to this new one. This video is primarily focused on the new component to be up to date. And luckily there are not enough huge changes that you're gonna to have to completely rethink this. Um, a lot of the concepts that uh, applied before are similar. It's just now a better API, in my opinion, that's a bit more intuitive. So let's go ahead and dive in. The first thing is, why is this important and what is so special about Next.js image? You can see here that I've got a repository that I will link to in the description. It's on my GitHub, and it also hosts the demo that we're gonna be looking through. Um, I probably will throw that on a subdomain of my home site. Um, I'll be sure to link that in the video description though. 
But anyways, what we have here, let me just uh, collapse command left to collapse everything on a Mac. And let me just walk you through what I have here. So I have a Next.js application and I set it up using, um, let's see, let's go Tailwind Next.js. I set it up with this install process because I have Next.js, TypeScript, and Tailwind CSS, which is my preferred stack at the moment. Um, and this guide right here tells you exactly how to get to the repository that I have here. So all I have is three pages, an index, homepage, uh, an example of low quality image placeholders, we'll get to that, and then a sandbox page that I'm gonna be using throughout the tutorial to kind of mess around with a few things. So pretty simple, there's nothing here in the API. And then in terms of the public directory, we just have a single photo that I grabbed from Unsplash. Um, I love this photo, I think it's just really cool and fun to look at. Um, and I've given attribution to the author of this uh, on the site. And then I guess, what else do we need to cover? The next config has some interesting things in the images config. Uh, we'll get to what those mean later. So let's get started. We're gonna open up the sandbox page, which is basically just um, starting out with a native HTML image. And I'm linking to that local photo that we have. Now, before we get into this, I wanna show you what the uh, properties of this photo are. So I'll go to the right here, and you can see that this is the uh, photo file saved to the disk, and the intrinsic size of this image is 4,500, or 4,544 by 2,840 pixels. Um, and it takes up 6.9 megabytes on the disk. So this is a pretty large image. So keep that in mind as we're going through this example. So let's go ahead and open this up. I've actually, if you hit control tilde uh, on the Mac, you can see the terminal pop up and I've got the next app running. So let's close that and go to localhost 3000. And what I've got here is the dev tools open in Chrome and I'm simulating a mobile device about 417 pixels wide. So let's go ahead and reload this page and note that I have the cache disabled. So we'll reload the page and what you're going to notice is that the size of this image is 6.9 megabytes, which is exactly what we saw here and I highlighted. And it took about 300 milliseconds to load this image. Now this is a local image over a local network, which means that 296 milliseconds is you know, probably faster than it will actually load in the wild. So what I wanna show you here, why you should care so much about this, is if we look at 6.9 megabytes for a single image, um, you should be worried. And I will admit that in my previous time before I really understood images on the web, um, I probably wouldn't have even looked at this and cared. But I'm telling you, this is huge. You should care a lot about this. And we're gonna talk about ways to get this down and to optimize it. Now, the reason this is a big deal is because on a slow network, it makes this uh, web page pretty much unusable. No one's going to wait for it to load. So to show you why you should care about this number so much, Remember, this took 300 milliseconds on a fast network uh, local image, 6.9 megabytes, and it's a JPEG file type. Let's go over to the Lighthouse tab, which is available in Chrome DevTools, which basically measures your core web vitals. So we're gonna look at a mobile device in this case, and let's go ahead and just uh, check all the categories and we'll just analyze the page load. So it's gonna simulate that mobile device and load our image. And here you go. The performance is a 47. No surprise there, we have a 6.9 megabyte image loading on this page. Um, it says Chrome extensions negatively affected this page performance. Try it in incognito. Okay, so we're on an incognito mode and we'll analyze the page load here. Okay, we increased our performance marginally, but we're still doing pretty terrible on that uh, front. 
And the reason is because the time to interactive is 8.3 seconds, which is terrible. And the largest contentful paint is 25 seconds, which basically means since this image is the largest uh, visual element on the page, that is referencing that right there. So it takes 25 seconds to fully load this image on, I guess, a normal mobile device. I'm not sure what sort of uh, network assumptions that they are using here, but nevertheless, this is Google telling us that, hey, if you put this website uh, live, we're going to uh, ding it in terms of your core web vitals and we're not gonna prioritize it um, for SEO purposes. And if those core web vitals didn't really do it for you, let's just throttle this network to a fast 3G and hit reload. And you're gonna see that it takes a long, long time to get this image rendered to the page. This is obviously a terrible experience for the user and we want to fix it. But really what we're trying to solve is the size of this image. Now, one thing that you could do is you could just not load such a large image. This image that we're loading is almost 4,000 pixels wide, and we could have saved a smaller file and just loaded that through the image component. There are other ways to do this though, and one of those is to use the Next.js image component. Another would actually be to use a source set, but that is used under the hood of Next.js image. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But let's go ahead and get this image component hooked up. We'll give it a source, um, or actually we will just statically import it. So kind of jumping ahead um, from our demos. Don't worry about how this is working quite yet. If you're unfamiliar, I'm just basically using a bunch of built-in features of the Next.js image right now to load this image statically. And we'll just put a placeholder alt in there. And now let's go back. We've got two images that apparently look the same, but they are very different types of images. So you can see here's the original one. Um, and this one's 6.9 megabytes. And you can see this one right here is the Next.js image. Here's the full request URL. You can see that it's being loaded from the next directory. And you can see that the width that was requested is 3840. And if you remember, the size of this one is 4544. So clearly they've shrunk this down just a little bit, still not to where we want it, but they have shrunk it a little bit. And they've given it a quality of 75. So if we were to close this out and look at the size, it goes from 6.9 megabytes to 658 kilobytes and it loads in six milliseconds rather than 314 milliseconds. Let's throttle this to a fast 3G again to simulate what it would look like on a mobile device that's over cellular data. And you can see that we've got our regular image just taken forever to load. And then I'll cut back into the video when we're finally loaded. All right, so we've finally loaded after 49 seconds. But you can see that the uh, native HTML image tag is loading in 49 seconds and our Next.js image is loading in 7.9. On a mobile device over a fast 3G network, that seems okay. We could still do better though. So let's come back and add a property that I'm not going to explain quite yet. Just take it for granted for now. And now let's go ahead and refresh the page, but I'm gonna get rid of this original image so that we don't have to wait for that. So let's refresh. We're still on that fast 3G network simulated. So it's gonna take a little bit of time uh, just to get the initial page. But then let's go ahead and look at this image and it has come down to 58.6 kilobytes and loaded in less than a second, just by adding that one size as prop. And the reason being is if we click on this URL, you can see it is now loading at a width of 828 rather than the several thousand pixels that we originally had. So what Next.js is doing under the hood, we will learn in a lot more detail 
uh, coming up, but basically what it has done is it has detected that we are on a mobile device and therefore we don't need a huge image to load. And so it can, it's going to dynamically grab that local image. It's going to resize it down to that lower mobile size. It's going to compress it and optimize it until um, it's 58.6 kilobytes. And you can also notice it went from a JPEG to a WebP image. Um, so there's tons of optimizations going on under the hood. And just by changing our syntax from this simple syntax here to this right here, we've basically saved ourselves like literally 40 seconds um, on a mobile 3G device. And just to give a benchmark of where we should be with this, um, here's the Web Vitals page, web.dev slash vitals. And these are the three big ones, largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift. And you can see that the LCP should be within 2.5 seconds of when the page first starts loading. So in other words, that big image that we're loading needs to happen in 2.5 seconds or less. And as we saw with this last example, we were able to do that um, with the um, changes that we made here with the sizes and loading it with the Next.js image component. So that is the difference. That's why this is important. Let's go back to our, uh, our table of contents here. So we covered these first two. Now the question is, what does image optimization and transfer transformation even mean? and how is it related to the Next.js image component. Now this is some background information that I think is important, very important to understand. You can skip this if you already understand it, um, but I know when I first started using Next.js image, I wasn't aware of all the things that went on behind the scenes. So let's go to the image optimization page that Vercel documents. So let me show you the path to get here. I know I've got a, quite a few um, things open at the moment. So the relevant documentation that we have here is here's the Next.js image component. This will tell you all the properties that we can use. We'll come back to this. You can also click image component and image optimization documentation, which is right here and also here. So there's two places on the Vercel websites that you can read about this, but basically um, image optimization, with image optimization, we can improve loading performance due to images being cached at the edge. In other words, we want to load images, um, cache them and serve them over a CDN, which is the edge Vercel network reduction in bandwidth usage, which saves you money. So remember when we first loaded that image, it was 6.9 megabytes. Then it was all the way down to like, you know, 30 some kilobytes. All of that bandwidth is costly. You have to pay for that. And at larger scales, that adds up very quickly. And then also minimizing the risk of lost traffic. So once again, going back to our example, if it takes 40 seconds to fully load an image, someone's going to leave that page. They're not gonna wait for it. And then overall visitor experience, we'll get way more into the UX side of things um, as we go. But I would recommend reading this page right here. Um, I'm going to basically explain all of it throughout the tutorial. But the one thing I wanna talk about is the pricing of this. So this is the pricing of the image optimization API, which is actually provided to you by the Vercel platform. So if you are deploying your Next.js application to the Vercel platform, which is pretty much the only place that you can deploy it, if you wanna leverage all of the serverless capabilities and all of the built-in stuff that Next.js offers. So you need to understand that one component of their pricing is related to image optimization. And it says here the image optimization is dependent on your plan and how many source images you have in your project. The hobby plan is free up to a thousand source images while the pro is free up to 5,000 source images and thereafter $9 per 1,000. Now it does not appear that there's any bandwidth limits here. 
So you're not going to run into that limitation, but some image optimization services do charge by bandwidth. So the question is, what is a source image or origin image supposed to be? Well, an origin image is a unique image that you are loading over their um, API. So in other words, if we looked at our mountain lake photo, this would be one source image. And if we loaded this 1000 different times, it's still only going to rack up one source image in your quota. Now, if you saved two or three versions of this, let's say that you saved a small, medium and large version in your public folder and you loaded each of those a thousand times, that's going to be three source images. So it doesn't matter how many times you load it, it's all about how unique the image is. So the ideal uh, situation here is that you will save um, in your public folder or your database or your object storage, you know, something like AWS S3 buckets. You wanna save the largest, highest quality version of the image that you are using. And then you let Vercel or your other chosen image optimization API, you let that take that image, resize it, compress it, and serve it in a bunch of different uh, formats and sizes and let all that work be done there. So let me close these out right here and let's talk a little bit about image optimization. I'm going to type in image IX and then we're also going to look at image kit. We're going to look at Cloudinary. All of these services, so ImageX um, or ImageIX is a visual media platform. And what it does is it gives you a rendering API, which allows you to basically pass uh, query params um, and pass different sizes to your images and dynamically resize images on the fly. So if you go to size and you go to width, you can see that it gives you documentation on all of this, and I'm not gonna get into the details too much, um, but this is basically saying like, you'll store your one origin image on there somewhere in storage, so AWS S3 buckets or something like that, and then ImageIX will download that image and do all of the compression and, and resizing, and then all you have to do is pass this width uh, param to your URL and it will resize the image. Now I have an example of this. Um, so Unsplash is obviously a popular image service. And one of the things that they do is they support all of these different parameters. So they're using something like image IX under the hood or image kit, which is going to do a very similar thing or even cloudinary, which is probably the most popular one. Um, they are using one of these under the hood and they are basically allowing you to leverage that with their API. So I have this example image that we are using for this project. And if I were to give it a param in a width of 300 and hit refresh, it's going to return me a image that is 300 pixels. So if we were to inspect this, and reload the page and go to the network tab and let's not throttle it or anything. I'm sorry, I, I'm completely blanking here. We don't, we're not putting this through the network tab because it is the URL itself. So we need to grab this shrunk URL and go to our sandbox. And instead of this source, we're going to paste that URL and then we'll comment out the next JS image. So we're using the basic image, which means it's gonna load the full size um, or the intrinsic size. And then if we go to our sandbox and reload, you're gonna see that the total size is 19.9 kilobytes. And that is because we have loaded dynamically a much smaller image here. So you can see that this width of 300 has been passed and it's giving us a much smaller image. So that's just the benefit of having one of these image optimization APIs. And the key thing that you need to understand here is that the Vercel platform is running its own image optimization API behind the scenes. So it is literally running something like ImageIX, ImageKit, or Cloudinary behind the scenes. And that is what you're being charged for 
um, over that quota of a thousand origin images. And if you go to the, um, this is my Vercel dashboard, and you can see that I have 287 source images, and this is in the usage stats in the other category. So this is where the image optimization API, once again, similar to Cloudinary or ImageKit, is going to charge you. So that's really important to understand because behind the scenes, when you enable this image component with no other you know, configuration, deploy it to Vercel, it's automatically going to opt in to this image optimization API and you know, resizing like we did here is going to happen dynamically behind the scenes. And for each origin image that you have, you're going to eventually get charged for that if your site gets large enough. So if you want to opt out of this, you can pass an unoptimized um, flag or prop onto the image component and it will skip all the optimization it's doing behind the scenes. So if we go over to our sandbox again, we're now going to load a Next.js image, but now you'll see the type is JPEG and the size is 6.9 megabytes again because we opted out of image optimization. Let's remove that again, come back, reload. Now it's a WebP, 51.6 kilobytes, and you can see how much of a difference that makes that image optimization API but it does not come for free. It comes at a cost once you get to a certain limit. And that is where this component is so dangerous if you do not understand what it is doing for you. While we're on the topic of cost and Vercel and image optimization, this is a perfect time to talk about loaders. Now, if we go to the documentation um, for Next.js image, we're going to get into all of these required properties all these, you know, optional, here's the loader. Um, we're gonna talk about all of this stuff eventually, but while we're talking about the cost of things, we need to talk about loaders because it is directly related. And in my opinion, one of the most misunderstood things about Next.js image, at least for me, it was, this was something that I really overlooked and it was costly for me um, in terms of usage on Vercel. So you can see in the documentation, I'll try to make this bigger. I always try to get big screens for these tutorials. Um, the loader prop is a custom function used to resolve image URLs. Now you can also pass this to the Next.js config. Um, so configuration options down here, and you can see in the loader configuration that you can pass a custom loader and pass it a loader.js file, which I'm guessing needs to export a default function of the loader um, type. So this is an example of a custom image loader. I'm gonna show you something a little bit more um, advanced than just this. And then also, let me see if I can find it. There should be some preset loaders, but I think that might've been, um, that, that possibly was part of the next legacy image. So let's go to next legacy image docs and see. Yeah, so for the legacy image, it had these built-in loaders. I'm not sure that these are even um, valid anymore in the new image um, component. So don't worry about those. But anyways, you can see like ImageIX, Cloudinary, those are ones that I had talked about as other optimization APIs. Um, you could just pass a custom loader, but this is legacy image. We're in the new world here. So um, we just have to implement our own custom loader if we want that. So you can do that within the loader configuration of the next.config.js. So you just come down here and type loader, and then this would be custom, and then the loader file is path to file, something like that. But we can also do this on a per image basis. So that is assuming if you uh, implement it in next config, that's assuming that you want the same loader for every single image in your entire app. In many cases, that's not gonna be uh, valid, you may load images from different places. 
Um, so a combination approach could be more suitable. So in order to do a custom loader, I have created a component that demonstrates it. So here's my custom loader, and I'm gonna walk you through what it's actually doing. So before we do that, let's go over to the, um, the demo, and we're gonna make this a little bit bigger. Uh, let me get out of this mode for the moment, and then we'll go back to the home page, which has all of the demos. So we'll select a demo, custom loader, and here is the image that I'm loading with a custom Unsplash loader. So if you remember, the Unsplash API supports all of these parameters to dynamically resize images. So once again, if we go to this page and let's say that we give it a width of uh, you know 3000 and then a quality of 20, and then refresh the page, let's maybe even bump the quality or make sure that the quality is supported. Yeah, so quality for changing the compression. So let's do like two. I'm not sure you can really see the difference. Maybe I'm not using that correctly, but whatever the case, um, you can see how we can pass these dynamic uh, query params. So we can implement a loader that is a custom loader for Unsplash so that every time that we load our Unsplash images, we are leveraging that Unsplash API rather than Vercel's built-in API. So in this fictional scenario where the only images that you load into your application are from Unsplash, you definitely want this custom loader because you're going to save yourself all of those source images on Vercel that you otherwise would have been um, you know, accumulating if you would not use this loader. So that is the key point with these loaders is once you have a loader enabled, that means that you are telling Vercel, hey, we don't wanna use your image optimization API. Please don't charge us for it, but we still wanna optimize our images through your components. So let me close a few of these things here. And you can see that I've imported the Unsplash loader from the utils folder. So I've separated that out. And you can see this is the implementation. So I have a type of image loader, which I have should be importing the type of from next image. And that takes a source with in quality prop. So the first thing that I'm doing is I'm assuming that the source value can either be a relative or absolute URL. So in order to assume that, I'm going to write a function called normalize unsplash URL. I'll give it the base URL that we're dealing with, which could be in an environment variable, in a real project, and then I'm basically figuring out whether the first three letters is HTTP, and then if so, I'm passing the source, otherwise I'm prepending um, the unsplash base URL and uh, adding the path to it. So that's normalizing the URL. This is a URL object that has search params. And then in these three blocks, what I'm basically doing is I'm searching for the auto, the fit, and the width param in the URL. And if I find it, that's what I'm setting it to. So I'm just keeping it. Otherwise, I'm gonna give it the defaults of format, max, and then the width to a string value. And then if there's a quality passed to the loader, I'm giving it a quality uh, string as well. So if we were to go to the custom loader here, you can see that I can uh, pass the props.source, which is being passed into my custom loader function. And then here's the alt with height. And then let's go ahead and pass in a quality just so that I can show you what I'm doing here. And let's do it different than the default of, I think, 75. Let's do it to like 60. So we'll save that. And then let's go back um, to my index page. And I'll show you how this is being passed. So we're using this custom loader right here. And I've passed it the relative URL, which is that um, path that you can see right here to the unsplash photo. And you can see that I am not passing any query params. I am passing a width and a height. Um, and then let's go ahead and load that in the browser. So refresh, um, select the custom loader demo, and then let's go ahead and open up this network tab and see what we've got. 
So the loader constructed this URL right here, images.unsplash, the source, and then it gave it an auto property of format, a fit of max, a width of 1920, and a quality of 60. So the only thing that's a little bit tricky here is that width of 1920, and that is because um, we didn't actually give it a width of 1920. We'll talk a lot more about that in a minute. The main reason that I wanted to show you this is to explain loaders, how you can set one up for yourself, and what it's actually doing, which might I remind you, it is basically saying to Vercel, hey, I've got my own image optimizer, um, whether it's Unsplash, ImageIX, ImageKit, or Cloudinary, or something else, and you're saying, hey, I've got my own uh, image optim optimization API, I'm paying for those, and so I don't wanna pay you to do the same thing when I'm already doing it. So in other words, we're leveraging the Unsplash API to do all of our you know, resizing, and we're forgetting about Vercel and not getting charged there. Okay, so I know I've kind of gone a little bit out of order in terms of introducing this component, but I hope that I've gotten through the most important points here. Number one being, why do you care about Next.js image? Well, it's because it does all sorts of things under the hood, whether it's optimization, resizing, different uh, image formats, and it makes our core web vitals way better. And then also the loader prop, very important to understand to know who you're paying for this image optimization. So I think it is now time to actually dive in to the details of using the Next.js image component. The next part of this video is gonna be uh, showing you all the examples that I've created and explaining what the different properties you can pass to Next.js image are actually doing. So this is where we really uncover what's going on behind the scenes, um, what the Next.js image is doing, what it's not doing, what for, where Vercel comes into the picture as a hosting platform, um, all that kind of stuff. So we'll start from the most basic example and work our way up to something that's a little bit harder to understand. So let me remind you, this demo that we're using basically has a dropdown and it has all of these different uh, possible scenarios or demos. And each of those demos corresponds one-to-one -one with the components that I've created here. So we'll start with a basic static um, example. And let's go to the corresponding documentation for this. So we'll go to the top of the next image documentation, and then we'll go to the source property. So source, pretty straightforward. If you've done any web programming, you know what this is. It's the path to the image that we're trying to load to the page. So it says it must be one of the following, a statically imported image file or a path string. This can be either be absolute or an internal path depending on the loader prop. Okay, we talked about those loaders already. Um, the path is dependent on how that loader is actually loading the image. So let's go to the statically imported image file documentation because that's what we're looking at right now. And you can see that it goes straight to local images and it says to use a local image, import your JPEG, PNG, or WebP files. So those are the supported files. I think AVIF um, are also supported if you enable that in the next config. But for most, most people, this is probably enough. So you can see the syntax is you just import a variable and you give it the path to the image. So you can see that I've done that here with my mountains photo. I've just gone to the public directory and imported the mountain lake JPEG. When you do this, if we hover over this, you can see that it is a static image data type. So if we were to, um, let's go ahead, I think I can probably import that static image data and then command click to go to that. And so here's the interface that we have for the static image data. And this is what um, Next.js under the hood is going to load about your image. So it's doing a couple things. It's grabbing the source, it's calculating the height and the width of that image, which I'll explain why that's important here in a minute. Um, and then it also has something called blur data URL, blur width and blur height. Those are a little bit more complex and I'm not gonna yet dive into those. 
So the first thing I want to talk about here with Next.js image, we're going to cover this right off the bat. And that is that a width and a height is required for your images. The reason that the width and height is required is because of cumulative layout shift. So if we go to the Web Vitals page, you can see that of the big three Web Vitals, cumulative layout shift or CLS that measures visual stability is one of those. And you should maintain a CLS of a factor of 0.1 or less. So cumulative layout shift happens when, say, you load an image, but you don't know the height and the width beforehand. And so the browser loads the image, but it's an empty space at the beginning. And then once the image loads, it gets much larger and it totally jolts the page on the user. So if you've ever loaded a web page and when you're loading the page, you try to click a link, but then you know, it loads a little more and it shifts the page down and you actually end up clicking an ad or something like that. That's cumulative layout shift and it's extremely frustrating to the user, which is why it's prioritized here in the web vitals. So one of the key components of Next.js image is that it basically says you have to provide a width and a height because we want CLS to be eliminated with our images. So it's a good best practice to adhere to. Um, and it's a little bit frustrating to folks who have not, um, who don't understand what CLS is, including my former self, and have used the previous, like just a native HTML image. And you're going to the Next.js image and it's saying we need a width and a height. And you're like, well, why? I don't like, I don't know it. Um, I don't want to look it up. I don't care. And so it's just frustrating, but it's a really important aspect of this. And the reason that a statically imported image does not require that width and height is because this object, the static image data, as we saw here, is actually already got the height and the width supplied with it. So you can see down here in this extra metadata, I'm actually taking this mountains uh, import and I'm printing the source width, height, blur width, blur height, and blur data URL to the UI. So it's being passed to the image itself and I'm printing it in the UI. And as you see um, with the static image example, you can come down here and let me make this a little bit bigger for us. And you can see I printed all those out and there's our 4544 uh, pixel intrinsic width calculated. And then you'll also see a calculated blur width of eight and a calculated blur data URL of this right here where it's past that width of eight and given it a quality of 70. So that is our next topic of discussion with Next.js image and it goes hand in hand with this static import. So one of the things that Next.js image allows us to do is put a placeholder in the UI. So what does this mean? Well, it basically means that instead of loading a blank space, it's going to try to render some uh, representative colors of that full size image before the full size image is actually loaded. So to really demonstrate this, I'm gonna comment out the placeholder blur, which is gonna disable it. And then we're going to um, turn on some throttling. So we're gonna call this a fast 3G network, reload the page, it's going to go to the, the main page here. And by the way, the reason that I'm resetting the demo on each page load is so that we don't by default load a certain image. Um, I want it to only load when we click on it. So let's click on static image and you can see there's an empty spot and it's completely blank and then it automatically appears. So there's two things to notice here. The first thing is there is allocated space for this image, and that's what we were talking about with the cumulative layout shift and that width and the height. So if we were to go back and comment out the image here and instead put in a basic image of mountain lake JPEG, so if we just use the regular image uh, tag that is provided through HTML um, rather than Next.js, we're not going to be assigning it a width and a height to start with. So we're just importing this image. 
and this is going to cause cumulative layout shift. So I've reloaded the page here, and when we click static image, take note of what happens at the very beginning and then once the image starts loading. I've put this on a fast 3G network to slow things down for us to see. So I'll click static image, and did you see that right there? All this text right here started at the top, and then once the image dimensions were loaded, then it put the image in, and now it's loading pixel by pixel down the page. So those are some, you know, basically a terrible user experience. So with Next.js image, let's comment out the native component or tag, and then let's put in the placeholder blur again and save. And what this is going to do is it's going to take um, the calculated blur data URL, which is just a data URL. So let's look at that. And data URLs are URLs prefixed with the data scheme. Um, and this is basically something that loads uh, immediately on the page load and is available uh, within, the, within the page. And this is a much quicker way to show something than trying to wait for the full image to load. So watch what happens on this fast 3G network when we uh, reload the static image. So I need to reload the page once. Now when I click this static image, just take note of number one, where does that text that we had start on the page? And then number two, how does the image load? Does it go you know, from the top to the bottom and show you pixel by pixel or something else? So we'll click static image and you see this right here. This is interesting. That was the blur data URL that basically took the colors and representation of this image and it put it as a placeholder, as a low quality image placeholder prior to the full size image actually loading. And what we can do is we can see that in the network tab. So you can see now that there, there are actually two images loading. The first one is that low quality image placeholder. And you can see that this has a width of eight and a quality of 70. Now the question is, what happens when you load a width of eight and then expand it to the full size? Well, it's gonna get extremely blurry, but it's going to load infinitely faster than um, another version of this image, which is the second one we're loading, which is the full width of 3840. So it first loads this, throws it in as a placeholder in that allocated space, and then it replaces it with this once this has fully loaded. And if we look at the response times, that uh, low quality image placeholder took 573 milliseconds on a fast 3G network, while the large one took 4.25 seconds. So this is going to provide a much better user experience. And I think anyone can look at this and be like, this is way better. This is exactly what we want when we're loading a web page. So while we're on the topic of low quality image placeholders, I want to show you how to do this on your own because oftentimes you are not going to have a static image. Um, and Next.js um, behind the scenes is going to basically calculate that blur placeholder for you when you import it statically. But the second you don't have that static image available, it's not going to do it. So let me go to the next example, which is a basic remote image, okay? And this basic remote image, if we go back to the browser and um, load the remote image, you can see that there's empty space and then it's going to load in, okay? So if we try to enable the placeholder right here of blur, you might say, oh, I'm gonna try to get that blur placeholder. Um, we've got a width and a height, so let's save it but now you're going to get an error when we reload this. So let me, uh, I always lose where this is. Okay, so let's do no throttling, so this loads faster. And then let's go to the remote image and it's going to give us an error. And it says it has placeholder blur, but is missing the blur data URL property. In other words, since this is not a statically uh, loaded image, 
that blur data URL has not been calculated. So we have to do that on our own if we want to enable that blur uh, placeholder property. So I've actually set up an example here. Um, placeholder blur, let's get rid of that in this remote example. Um, and then let me just go through this real quick so that you're aware. With a remote image, we have an external URL and we're passing that to the source and then alt class name, blah, blah, blah. But the important thing is uh, we have to pass this width and height. And I think this is actually an outdated width and height that I've passed. I should probably update that. It really should be 4544 by 2840. So 4544, what did I just say? 2840, something like that. Yep, so that's the correct width and height. And this is what's going to be the intrinsic size of this image. So with no other configuration, it's always going to load something close to this. But Next.js image is going to look at the size of your viewport and load probably a smaller size than this full size. Um, so if we reload the page and select that remote image demo and look at what was loaded in the network tab, um, you're going to see that it loaded a width of 3840 and I'm going to show you later where that came from and how that works. But for now I'm going to go and show you this um, LQIP example. So this is another page that I have created uh, within this Next.js app. And if we go to LQIP example, you'll see this loading and if you look right there, you'll see that placeholder has those different colors. And if I put on uh, a fast 3G to make it a little slower, you'll really get to see that placeholder that we're putting in there. So there's the placeholder, all the colors are represented, and then it will be replaced with the full size image the minute that loads. So there you go, it loaded. Now I wanna show you how I'm doing that. And also, you might have noticed that blur was a little bit different than the one we saw uh, natively implemented by Next.js. It's just a different algorithm that we're using, which is why that's happening. So in order to do this, we actually have to use some server side code. So I'm using the get static props function, which is going to run at build time. So when Vercel builds your application, this code will run and it will provide this set of props down here to your page component. So in this case, all I'm doing is I'm taking this photo, which remember, this is the path to that photo as highlighted here on Unsplash. And I'm going to normalize the Unsplash URL. If you remember that, it's just adding the base to it so that we know where to get it. Then what I'm doing is I'm using the fetch API and I'm going to fetch that URL. And then I'm going to turn that into an array buffer response by awaiting the response of fetch and calling the array buffer function, which is what this library that I've imported called LQIP modern is going to accept as a function param. So this is some code that you'll probably want to, you know, read up on in your own time. I'm not going to waste a bunch of time explaining how this works. But if you want to check it out, it's basically LQIP modern, which stands for low quality Im image placeholder. And it basically shows you how it works and what it's doing. And it will return this right here. So it returns an original width, an original height, uh, width height type and data URI base 64. Now this is important because as we talked about with data URLs in the base 64 format that are basically run um, immediately when the page loads, it requires that exact format. So this is a data URL and Next.js image, this image component um, right here is going to accept a data URL in base 64 format as that image placeholder. So I've spread the props of that image right here onto the component, but really what I'm doing here, if I comment that out, is I'm saying width equals image dot width, height equals image dot height, 
blur data URL equals image dot blur data URL, which again, this is a base 64 string um, that is in the correct format. Now it's yelling at me here um, because it says source is missing. And that is because I forgot to add that. So image dot source. All right, and you can also see that I'm loading it with the unsplash loader. Um, which is the correct way to do this because we're just leveraging Unsplash as API rather than Vercells. So with this configured, you'll see that this has been passed and we're using placeholder blur. And now we should not be getting any errors and we get that uh, blur placeholder. And right now it's loading, get static props, doing all that processing that would in reality be happening at build time. So this would not be that slow um, on a real app and then it puts the placeholder in there and then finally loads it. So that's a quick low quality image placeholder example. I highly recommend if you can to implement something similar to this for your images so that you have that nice aesthetic loading placeholder in the, the browser when all your images are loading. So with that out of the way, let's go back to our basic remote image. And I want you to check your understanding right here. There's something very wrong with what we're doing on this page. And let's see if you can find it, pause the video and test yourself. So the answer to that question is, we are just passing a source going directly to Unsplash. Now what that means is because we don't have a loader prop, is we're saying to Vercel as a platform that we're deployed on, we're saying, hey, we want to use your image API, so go ahead and download this image from Unsplash, optimize it yourself, resize it, and then cache it and serve it over your CDN. Now, again, source images cost money over your 1,000 uh, allocated source images. So once you get over 1,000 unique images, Vercel is going to start charging you money uh, to do this. So ideally, you should be putting in that loader prop and uh, passing the Unsplash loader, um, importing that from utils, and that would tell uh, Vercel to not optimize it. But this is just a basic example, so we'll leave it there. The next thing that we need to talk about, um, so we've gone through static, we've gone through remote images. Um, the next question is, what if we don't know the size of your image? Well, in that case, there's just a couple of things to note. Number one, you really should know the size of your image. And this is something that I didn't quite understand uh, when I first started, started using Next.js image. But in reality, you really should know the size of your image, whether that be stored as metadata in your database or from an external API that provides metadata about the image or even just probing the image for its size. So the way that I think about it is in steps here. So the first scenario is let's say that you have just a handful of images that you're using within your app. In this example here, we've got the mountains image and it was pretty easy for me to just open up the info about that image, get the dimensions and be able to provide those dimensions in order for Next.js image to work properly and give it the correct aspect ratio and sizing. Now, this is feasible if you've got a known number of images that are remote. Now, what if you have thousands of images? Let's say you have those stored on AWS S3 object storage, and you've got tons of those images, and unfortunately, you don't know the height and width of each of them, and you really don't feel like going out and you know manually getting the width and height. In that scenario, um, the best thing that you can do is implement some server-side code that will probe the image for its size and supply it to Next.js image. So if we look at the um, LQIP example, again, you can see that's exactly what we're doing. We're making a GET request to a specific remote URL and then we're processing it through LQIP and getting that original width, height, and data URI base 64. So in this case, we're having to do an extra step, but since it's happening at build time, 
it's not going to affect the performance of the application when the user goes to load those images. Now, of course, if you have thousands and thousands of images, you don't want that because your build times are gonna you know, approach 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, maybe even so long that it just doesn't even make sense anymore. In that case, a couple ideas would be incremental static regeneration, which is something that Next.js offers where you can only build the pages that uh, need to be rebuild, rebuilt. And in that case, you'd only be grabbing the relevant images. The next option that you have, and this is a pretty feasible option if you have a database running, is you might use an algorithm just like this to initially get the image width and heights and you know blur data URLs. But then you'll take that image and you'll save it in your, uh, your data store or your database as attributes. And then you might link those or associate those with the image that's stored in object storage. So an example you know, schema, let's just say uh, database schema example. An example schema you could come up with is a source, which would be a relative URL. Uh, which points to an AWS S3 uh, path, so something like that. And then you might have an image loader that will uh, prepend the base URL to where that's being served. So you might be serving that over your own CDN or your own CNAME um, that you need to add in front of that path. So you'll store the relative path in the database. You'll also store a width in the database, a height in the database. These are just dummy values. And then optionally, you could even do something like this and store the data URI base 64 string representation, which would go here. And then all you have to do on your pages is you load the images from your database and then you can pass all of this metadata to Next.js image, which will then use that to render the image performantly. So that's kind of your options when it comes to not knowing the size of your images, and that would be the best option. Now, there are workarounds uh, to this if you really just don't want to go to this hassle and you just need to resize an image dynamically, and that would be a responsive image. But before I get into that, I want to just show you one other package um, on NPM. So LQIP Modern is great, but there's a package called Probe Image Size, which is also really great. And this one, I believe how this works is it doesn't make like a full request for the image. So it doesn't like download the entire contents of the image like the LQIP Modern library does it just probes for that like width and height. So this would be a, a quicker, um, more performant way to just grab the width and height if you don't wanna go through this entire process. So just uh, an option for you. Now the next thing you can do is a responsive filled image. So if we go to the Next.js documentation for images, uh, let me go back and you can see that we've got the width and the height property that is required except for use with statically imported images, which in reality, that's just probing for the width and height already and passing it. So we're still providing a width and height, but it says you don't need it if you have the fill property set. So that also goes for the height. So if you have fill property set, which we'll come down here and look at, it says, this is a Boolean that causes the image to fill the parent element instead of setting width and height. The parent element must assign a position relative, fixed, or absolute style. And then by default, the image element will automatically be assigned to position absolute style. Okay, so then we have to basically use CSS to size this image. And I've shown this in an example. So let's make this a little bigger. We'll go back to the home page here. We'll put this on no throttling because I think we've seen enough demos with that. And let's go to responsive fill images. Now, as I'm resizing this, look what happens to this image. You can see that it's maintaining a constant height and the width is resizing and it's showing the image, um, it's maintaining the aspect ratio, but it's showing a different kind of view of that image 
depending on the size. So what we're doing here with this image is we're giving it a relative container and then that relative container has a fixed height. So let's just look at this in the code. Um, the relative container has a width of full and a height that is fixed. And I'm just bumping that height up uh, per the screen size. So on you know mobile devices, it's a height of 96, not pixels, but the tailwind units. Then we go up to 450 pixels and then 600 pixels. And you can see that I've added this uh, fill property and I've omitted the width and height. And if we were to give it a width of 200 or something and try to reload this, it's gonna say the image has both width and fill properties, only one should be used. So here we can't even provide a width and a height because it's going to fill this container right here. So once again, just to review, this image is going to be absolutely positioned and this container is relatively positioned. So it's going to fill the container and you can see I've set some class names, uh, one being object cover, which is what dictates how it's filling that container. So this is the cover. Now we could also change that um, CSS property. If I can drag this up, let's click on the image and then we'll go to the container and find that property. Actually, we need to go to the image. Where is it? Okay, so it says object fit cover. We can also pass something like contain. So if we did contain, watch how it resizes. When we do contain, it's always gonna maintain the aspect ratio and it may not fill the height of the container because it's trying to pervert, preserve that aspect ratio. There's other object fit properties. If we go to the Mozilla um, documentation, you can have fill, which does not preserve aspect ratio, contain, cover, none, or scale down. So you can play with these depending on what behavior you want to achieve here. So you kind of know how to use that fill property, but there's also something going on behind the scenes, very characteristic of Next.js image, that we need to talk about. And that is the source set and the sizes of this image. So the native image element to the browser actually has these already. So if you go to this page, I'll leave it in the description. Um, it's the MDN page on responsive images. So going back to this concept of loading the correct image size for the correct viewport, um, responsive images in this context of this article is saying exactly that. So the, the overall concept here is if we're on a mobile device, we don't want to load a full size image that's 3000 pixels wide because we're just wasting bandwidth. The, the user can never see it in that size. So why would you waste the bandwidth and load all that extra data? So that's the goal of responsive images. And throughout this guide that I highly recommend you read through to get like a native background of what's going on, it talks a little bit about how it, uh, the image element, so we're looking at the native image element, not Next.js. It talks about how the source set and sizes are used to dynamically grab the correct image based on the viewport. Um, so if we were to go to the native image uh, element, so we're literally on HTML elements image. So not Next.js image at all. You can see that there is a property called sizes and a property called source set. And the source set is one or more strings separated by commas indicating the possible image sources for the user agent to use. And you can paste in, or you can use an URL to an image and then optionally a white space followed by either a W or an X to describe how that uh, different source is to be treated. So if you remember with the concept of loaders, how we can reach out to an API uh, such as Unsplash and pass in all sorts of different sizes and dynamically get back different sized images as I'm doing right here, you would know that we would probably want to give a list of URLs that return the different sizes so that we can load them differently based on the, sorry about that, based on the size of the viewport. So that is what it's talking about with responsive uh, images in the source set. And you can see that with this uh, 
fill property, if we put the fill property on the image, it will automatically generate that. Now let's go back to the static image for a second. And let me, let me refresh so that we just have one image loaded. So the static image, this is a local image that we've loaded. Now let me click on the image. And what you'll see is that the source set is just a single image and it uses the 1x notation. And this image that was loaded, if we go to the network, um, we have the low quality image placeholder and then the full size image, which we're loading at 3,840 3, pixels wide. So not super ideal for this uh, smaller screen. But if we go to the elements, we go to the source set, you can see that that 3840 is the 1x uh, size. And it's actually smaller than the 4544, which is the original size of this image. So already Next.js has kind of uh, decreased that size a little bit for us and has used um, this second option, a pixel density descriptor, which is a positive floating point number directly followed by an X. Um, if no descriptor, it's assigned one X. Okay. And something to note is that the size that the source, uh, that the user agent uses is going to be based on different things, such as a media condition set in the sizes prop, um, and the source size value. So the user agent is the one that's responsible for selecting the correct one. And to my understanding, um, this takes into account pixel density, I believe. Could be wrong, leave it in the comments if I am. And to that, what we have to do is come to uh, mydevice.io, and on my device, you can see my CSS pixel ratio is two. So for every um, two pixels of screen, actually, I don't really know how to explain that, but other, <laughs> other words, um, this has something to do with the screen that I'm using, like the actual physical hardware, the, the MacBook that I'm using and the pixel density of that screen. So that I believe goes into that choice that the user agent is using to select the appropriate one from the source set. But once again, if we come back to this local image, you can see there's only one to choose from. And so that's the one that's gonna be chosen. But if we were to come to the responsive fill images, so remember, this is enabled by that fill property. Now you're gonna click on this image and see a bunch of images in that source set, like all sorts of them, going from uh, 640, 750, 828, 1080, all the way up to the 3840 width. And then if we go back to this image component, you're not gonna see any sizes set, but what you will see is that there is a sizes property automatically set to 100, of 100 viewport width. So in other words, what it's saying is it's telling the user agent to look at the viewport width and then select the photo from the source set that is closest to that calculated viewport width. So when we reload the page here, this is a 397 pixel uh, viewport width. So when we reload that and load the demo again, we would expect from that source set of images here that the 640 or the smallest one should have been loaded in the network tab. And we can confirm this by clicking here and looking and we see a width of 828, which is not the 640 that I was looking at. This is where I believe that pixel density comes in. And I think the user agent might be taking that viewport width and doubling it and finding the closest to double because my pixels pixel ratio is two. Um, once again, leave a comment if I'm wrong on that and you can explain it better. But anyways, it has chosen a smaller uh, image than the largest one, which is great because we don't have to load as much bandwidth and we can get a much faster load time on this. Now what's very interesting is that, I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. Um, what's very interesting is that as we resize this browser, watch over here in the network tab. There you go. You just loaded a new image. This time, this one is, let's see, where's the size? 1080. Let's go a little further. There's another one. This one's 1200. A little further. 
this one is 1920, so on and so forth, all the way up until the largest one, which is uh, bigger than 2048. Let's see, it should be, there it is, the 3840. So that's the largest one that it'll, it'll load. So obviously a user's not gonna be resizing their browser like that, but this is just a demonstration of how a different network request um, that will pull a different size image which means different loading speed is gonna happen per the viewport width automatically when we enable this fill property. So that's really important. Um, the next thing that I need to talk about here is where are all those source sets coming from? So we clicked on the element and we saw all these source sets, but it's like, where did these numbers come from? Like, why, why, are, the, why are they 640, 750, 828, so on and so forth? Well, if we were to come to the next config, so next.config.js, what I've done is copied the default device sizes and image sizes that Next.js provides. So as you can see, the device sizes are 640, 750, 828, and by now these numbers should be looking pretty familiar to you. So if we were to change these, you'll see how our source set will change. So let's bump this highest one. Let's bump that up to maybe, um, actually, let me uncomment. I want to comment this out so that I have the original as a reference. And let's bump that up to 4,000. And then let's bump this lower one down to 200. Um, or actually, let's go 350 because that's about the size of a mobile device. So now if we go back and Let's go to our 292 width. So this is a super mobile device, super small. And then let's reload. Um, and before I do this, I need to actually restart the server because I've changed the next config. So need to make sure and restart the server, reload the page. And now we can select the responsive fill images. And let's check out that network tab. So right here, we're loading 750, which is lower than the 828 we initially loaded. Um, I think it's still doubling it based on my pixel density. But as we go to the largest possible image, you see all of these new network re requests coming in. But you see this width down here of 4,000? That highest possible width has now changed, and we're loading a larger image based on that device size. So that configuration, that you see in the device sizes array, you should generally set that to the sizes you want um, generated in your source set. Usually the defaults are gonna be okay for most uh, people, but if you have a reason to change it, you can. One of those reasons, maybe you're developing like a, um, a web app that needs to be shown on a huge screen, like maybe even a TV. You might wanna bump up this highest bound so that you can load larger images than three. 1840 pixels wide and while we're here I'll just address the image sizes this I believe used to be something that was part of the legacy image and there was some sort of logic that went on that said if the um, layout was like fill um, then it would use like device sizes and if it was like um, fixed or default or whatever then it would use image sizes I'm not quite sure how this works with the new Next.js image, and I couldn't really find documentation on it. Um, all I know is that the device sizes is what you're going to use to generate that source set. The image sizes is yet to be known, and leave a comment if you do know the difference between these two with, in regards to the new Next.js image implementation. And then finally, the minimum cache time to live is something that we'll set to like 60 seconds. One thing to note is this cannot be invalidated right now. Um, the Vercel platform just doesn't have an option to do that. So you're best to keep this at a small value. Um, this is basically telling how long the image that was downloaded, um, optimized and resized will stay uh, stored. And basically it just means how often is Vercel as a platform going to have to re-optimize this image. If you're using a loader, obviously this doesn't matter because you're reaching out to a different image optimization service to do the same thing. Um, so anyways, that's what those options are. 
A um, little bit of a digression, but very important to understand these device sizes. Now, the next question we have to ask here is we've got these um, the sizes array, and it is set automatically for us on the image fill. But what happens if we're not using the fill property? What happens if we're using just your plain old, um, you know, give it a width and a height similar to this with the remote image? Does it do the same thing? Well, as we saw with the remote image, it's not going to generate that source set by default. So what I've laid out is a responsive fixed example. So this is, um, we're just using a local image. It doesn't matter if it's local or remote, the behavior is gonna be the same. As long as you're not using the fill property, that source set is not gonna be automatically uh, generated for you. But all you have to do is add the sizes prop right here and give it a fallback of 100 viewport width. And what's gonna happen is that will uh, trigger the source set generation. Now let's uncomment that for a second and go to the responsive fixed example. So let me go to 100%. We'll go to responsive fixed images and you can see uh, that loaded and we're going to get a source set on the image of just one X. Um, so we just have one image to choose from. And by default, you don't see any sizes property set on this native image element. And so it doesn't have a lot to choose from. But the second that we enable that fallback of 100 viewport width, you're going to see this source set has now been generated and you have all of those device sizes that have been generated as well as that sizes. So now if we load a mobile device and we go to the network tab and select that responsive fixed image, you're gonna see the low quality image placeholder and then here you'll see that it was loaded at a width of 384. So actually I believe this is where those image sizes has kicked in. We're on a small enough screen that um, that that image size of 384 was actually selected rather than the device size of 640. So let's look at that source set one more time just to get a sense and it goes all the way from a width of 4,000, um, which we have not reloaded the server, which is why that's still serving as 4,000 rather than the 3840. So let's refresh, go back to responsive fixed and open up the image. So now we're back to the 3840 is the, the max one and then it goes all the way down to the 640 and then below that, I guess it's selecting from the image size array. So the image size is right here. So now as we resize, you're gonna see more network request for the progressively larger images that we're loading. So as you can see, this one's now 1080. So that's how you enable that for a static or remote image and get that source set generation happening by default. Now, what happens if we change this? What happens if we set this to 10 viewport width? What this is gonna do is now, every time it looks at the source set, it's gonna find the image that's closest to 10% of the current viewport width. So let's go with a 500 pixel wide viewport and refresh, and then we'll go to the responsive fixed images, and you'll see that it's blurry now. Now there's a reason it's blurry is because if you remember, we just set 10 viewport width, which means 10% of this 500 is the target image size right now. So 10% times 500 is 50. So it's trying to load and find the closest source set size to 50 pixels. And if we click on what was actually loaded, you'll see that it grabbed a width of 96, which is uh, in the next config, it's this one right here, 96 in image size, which is the closest uh, to that 50 pixels. I'm actually not sure why I didn't grab the 64, but anyways, it's close. And so what it's trying to do is it grabs the width of 96 and then it expands it to the 500 pixels, which makes it blurry. And that's actually the whole concept of this low quality image placeholder of the width of eight expanded out it's just faster to load and it makes it blurry. So with this information, we can do some interesting things. And that's where the next demo comes in. So let's uh, flip this back 
to 100 viewport width. So we keep that example. And now we're coming to a responsive fixed grid. And now what we've done is instead of just adding 100 viewport width to the sizes, which will trigger the source set generation, we're now adding some media queries. So what we're saying, let me show you the UI first. So let's reload. Let's come to responsive fixed grid. And what you'll see is at different viewports, this grid is gonna resize according to this code. So we have display grid. On mobile, it's gonna be one column. On small devices, two columns. Large devices, three columns. And what that means is that as we resize, you'll see the columns, two column and three column. Okay, so obviously as we resize this, the image size requirements are going to change. So even though we're on a larger device, we are still loading smaller images than even a mobile device here. So with this like roughly 500 pixel wide mobile device, we're basically loading five, you know, sub 500 uh, pixel wide photos. Well, on a large device, these photos are even smaller than that to start out with. So we can tell the image component about this behavior so that we can get optimized loading of these images. So at a max width of 576, um, we want it to be 100 viewport width. And theoretically, these should be your breakpoints for that correspond to these up here. So what I'm gonna do is actually go to a new tab. And let me, let me clean some stuff up. I'll leave all these as resources. Oh, here's a... a article on WebP formatting by Google. We talked about that a little bit earlier, but I didn't show you that. We can get rid of this, get rid of this. Okay, so if we were to come to Tailwind Breakpoints, my breakpoints are set based on these default breakpoints. So my small device is 640, my large is 1024. So really what I need to do to sync this up perfectly is set it to 640 and 1024. So now exactly at those breakpoints, those different image sizes are gonna load. So what I'm saying is uh, here is on mobile devices or any device less than 640, I want you to load um, an image that is approximately 100% of the viewport width because it's a single column. Then when I go to a large uh, device, so anything less than 1024, or actually this would be the, the small breakpoint, I want you to load 50 viewport width, which is that columns two, so two columns. And then otherwise, if it's larger than that, load 33% of the viewport width because we're loading three columns. So those are the instructions we've given it, and let's see if it actually works. So we will start down here on a mobile device. We'll refresh the page and go to our responsive fixed grid. Here's the low quality image placeholder. And then we've got our image that we're just repeating three times. And you'll see that it loaded a width of 828, which is uh, relatively close to that viewport size. Now, as we resize this, we get another image, which goes to 1080. Um, and remember, we're still on the, the mobile size. So this is really just grabbing that image based on the different mobile sizes. But once we break, you'll see that there was no reload. So let me refresh the page and go to responsive fixed grid. And you see those two net re network requests here. Now, as the grid breaks into two columns, notice how, well, that was not two columns. Really trying to drive this point home. So let me refresh one more time. Responsive fixed grid. Here's our initial image of 1200. And as we break the grid, there, it just broke at that breakpoint. You can see there is no additional network request because now our requirement is 50% of the viewport width, which we've already got an image that satisfies that. So as we go up with this grid, all the way to our three column layout, we never see another network request. And it's gonna take us until we get to a very large uh, screen size. Let's go up to like, you know, something really large like 4400. 
And at that point, our images are, you know, 1400. So we've made another network request that grabs bigger images. But until we get to those huge sizes, it's not going to request any new images. And that's because we don't require it. Now, if we were to come back and remove these sizes entirely, and we just said sizes equals 100 viewport width, now what's going to happen is as we reload the page and we go to responsive fixed grid and we resize these, we're going to get a bunch of new network requests. And when we break into that two column grid, it's going to still be loading larger and larger image sizes because it thinks that we need them because we're getting a bigger screen size. But in reality, we're just, um, you know, making the images not as wide because we have them in a grid. So this is a pretty detailed uh, but important realization about the sizes property is you can use those in the, the case where you know that you need a certain size and the behavior of that responsiveness changes, i.e. a grid layout um, or even flexbox wrap. And you can provide those in the sizes here. Okay, so we've gotten through pretty much all of the basic use cases. I know I went into pretty good depth about all of them, but hopefully that finally like makes things click for you like it did me when I you know, was researching all of this stuff. Um, so those are the most common scenarios. Feel free to leave a comment if I missed one. I can make a follow-up video or maybe a GitHub gist as an example. Um, the last thing that we need to cover is a brief migration guide from next legacy image to next image. I'm not going to go into a ton of depth here. Let's go to the documentation and go to next legacy image. And you've got this nice comparison that they've provided us. Um, and it says compared to next legacy image, the new Next.js image component has the following changes. Previously, the image was wrapped in a span wrapper around image in favor of the native computed aspect ratio. This, in my opinion, was kind of confusing, which is why they changed it. Uh, I think a lot of people found it a little bit confusing. Then also, it adds support for the canonical style prop. In other words, we can now put classes directly on the image component rather than on that outer span, um, which caused all sorts of problems. and. Um, that prior layout property, um, if we come down here and look at the layout, it had this whole grid of intrinsic, fixed, responsive, and fill. And if you read through this before and you understood it, congratulations, because I certainly did not. Um, this was a very confusing and unintuitive way to uh, build this API, in my opinion. And I think they realized that with all the questions that they got. And so they just said, okay, let the style determine the size, and then you can use the native sizes and source sets to determine how that, how the size of image is selected, which we just went through. There's also something about lazy loading. Um, I didn't really cover all that stuff. Um, also, it removes the loader config in favor of the loader prop. So you used to be able to uh, set the loader config. I think I was talking about that earlier with the presets. Now you just pass it directly as a loader prop. Um, let's see, what else? Change the alt prop from optional to required. That's just kind of a best practice. And then the on loading complete callback to receive the reference to the image element. I didn't really cover this, and I think a lot of people were using the on loading complete as a hack where it would basically they would wait for the image to load and then they would use that uh, information about the image to supply the width and the height, which totally defeated the purpose of the cumulative layout shift. So I'm not sure what a great use case for this would be, but the overall changes that you're going to experience going from legacy image to the new image is around these styles. You're now just styling it directly rather than trying to use that layout property that has this complex grid of different you know, types of layouts. I've gone through all of those examples of how you get responsive images with this new Next.js image component. I hope that you found this useful. Um, please share it if you did. Subscribe to the channel. Give it a like. Anything helps. Um, and be sure to leave a comment in the video for anything that didn't make sense. 
happy to do some follow-ups on it. Until next time, I'll see you later.